we are facing the most serious constitutional crisis that this country has faced since the Civil War. And what is happening is a conscious plan by the most powerful forces in the governmental structure, in the industrial structure, to experiment with the undermining and abandonment of the most elementary constitutional rights of all of the people set forth in the Constitution. Suspending the Constitution of the United States, suspending the Congress and replacing it with a military government, suspending local and state legislatures, suspending the courts and replacing it with military tribunals and establishing detention camps throughout the country in which any person who didn't agree with this proclamation would be thrown in. What the American people must never forget is that when fascism comes to America, it will come wrapped in an American flag. Arthur Kinoy is one of America's greatest fighters for civil liberties. We all owe a great deal to him, and he's going to be with us right now on Alternative Views. Attacks upon American civil liberties occur regularly in the United States, and the situation is getting worse. What is happening and why are the focuses of our program with Arthur Kinoy. But before we interview Arthur, here are a couple of news stories from the Alternative Press. On Sunday, April the 29th, the New York Times Magazine had a story by Seymour Hersh, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, called the Iran-Contra Committees, Did They Protect Reagan? According to Hersh, the congressional investigations in the Iran-Contra hearings failed to investigate certain key elements of the scandal. Hersh thus analyzes the limits of the Iran-Contra hearings, what they were afraid to analyze. Hearst said that the congressional committees decided from the beginning not to seek evidence that would lead to impeachment hearings and thus protected Reagan throughout. Hirsch's investigations, for instance, reveal that one of Oliver North's associates, James Radzinski, saw two memos that listed the details of the illegal diversion of funds from the Iran arms sales to the Contras. Radzimski was testify, was scheduled to testify at the hearings after Oliver North, but North's popularity was so great that the Iran-Contra committees decided to cancel Radzimski's presentation. He had seen the memo, two memos, that had listed exactly what was going from the Iran arms sales to the Contras that was sent to Poindexter, that had Poindexter's initials, and that was sent up to uh, Reagan for his inspection and for his initialing. It was precisely this missing gun, this smoking gun, that was the subject of the search of the committees and that they never discovered, and therefore they decided that Reagan was innocent. Well, someone saw the incriminating memos, but because Oliver North was so popular, they were afraid to put this guy on afterwards who would contradict North's testimony that Reagan didn't really know anything about the diversions and thus would save Reagan from impeachment. Hirsch also revealed in his investigations that the White House had a full backup system to all of its computers which would have allowed retrieval of all documents 
pertaining to the case, such as the one that Radzimski claims to have seen. The White House, however, refused to put this retrieval system into operation and to provide the committee with its documents on quote-unquote national security grounds. Hirsch also revealed that discussion of this computer system led to the revelation that Reagan regularly taped his phone calls with foreign leaders. But this material also was not demanded by the investigating committees. In other words, the investigating committees did not demand the most crucial documents that were in the White House computers that might have implicated Reagan, Bush, Casey, and any number of other White House honchos in a full range of Iran-Contra scandals. But they, for, they did not allow the committees to have access to their retrieval system of their computer, and the committees just went, away, went along with this and thus never really investigated the salient documents pertaining to the tapes. Plus, discovering that Reagan had a recording system revealed the possibility there might be tapes like the Watergate tapes. You remember that during the Watergate hearings, it was revealed that Richard Nixon taped all of his conversations in the White House office. These tapes were subpoenaed after a big struggle. Eventually, the committee got the tapes, and this led to Nixon's impeachment or his resignation. And they could have done the same thing with Reagan, but they refused to go after these tapes. So Hearst shows the extent to which these congressional hearings basically were protecting Reagan from impeachment. And he interviewed all kinds of people on these hearings who said, yes, we definitely did not want to impeach Reagan. It was late in his term. He was too old. He was too senile. He wouldn't have known what was going on. It would have been a national embarrassment. There was a lot of national security issues involved. So we just decided to stonewall and thus admitted that they did a uh, cover-up. So the Congress has been doing the same thing with George Bush, because George Bush was more directly involved in all of these machinations than uh, Reagan was. And, but the committee is the same thing. You read little bits and pieces here and there about what the committees have done and what they haven't done. And when it gets close to Bush, well, then they cut off the investigation. Did, did he mention that? Hirsch only went into very slight aspects of Bush's involvement in this, and thus, in that sense, he participated in the decentering <laughs> of Bush, trying to make it appear that Reagan was the uh, guy uh, behind this, or the person that should uh, bear the uh, full responsibility for it, whereas it seems that Bush had much more operational involvement in the illegal arms diversion to the uh, Contras and even the sales of arms to the Iranians than uh, Reagan did. Of course, Bush denies he had any involvement whatsoever with any of these scandals, but the investigative report, uh, press, but not uh, Hirsch, uh, has fully documented the extent of Bush's involvement. Hirsch did come out with one other devastating revelation that the committees covered over. He learned that there was a second illegal diversion of funds from the Iranian arms sales to Israel via a Swiss bank account for covert operations in the Middle East for which there was no legal authority. After initiating investigations of these operations, the Israeli diversion, the committees chose not to discuss them in public or to consider any of the constitutional questions they raised in public uh, hearings. Uh, Hearst's investigations revealed that the committee did not want to endanger disruption of U.S. relations with Israel or want to pursue investigations of the various Israeli operations for the U.S. in places like the Middle East or uh, Central America. In other words, the illegal diversion of funds from the Iranian arms sales to the Contras was well documented and the subject of these hearings. But there was a second illegal diversion of funds that went from the Iranian arms sales to the Israelis who were helping supply the countries in uh, Central America were doing deals with uh, Noriega, were helping the death squads in uh, El Salvador, and were doing various things to quote unquote fight uh, terrorism in the uh, Middle uh, East. And these were supported, funded by the CIA through these illegal um, diversions of uh, funds so that the Israelis were in effect being an arm of the U.S. government, were being an adjunct to the CIA. The American press always talking about the economic miracle of Taiwan or Korea or Singapore everywhere. Well, guess where another economic mir uh, miracle is going on? We haven't heard about it. Vietnam. The article surprised me that I saw in The Guardian 
a while back because it, before that, all we'd heard about the, was the terrible things that were happening in Vietnam, the economic misery and the bureaucracy and the, they were having trouble with the dissatisfaction with the people. So they decided to have a little perestroika of their own. So they dismantled a lot of the bureaucracy. They cut loose. The, a lot of the government enterprises and turn them over to private enterprises. They had a lot of the farmers uh, go back and do their own crops instead of in cooperatives or collective farms. And that's the last I'd heard for a long time. And then suddenly we find that, hey, the economy of Vietnam is really strong. Not only strong, they have, uh, they're exporting. They have a, a s export surplus. And uh, apparently this is the economy of Vietnam is attracting the multinational corporations. Why? Well, in Indonesia, factory workers get about $60 a month. In Vietnam, it's 30 So, as one uh, international uh, uh, businessman said, I'm bullish on Vietnam. Well, what about the United States? Well, the Americans are still barred from trading or investing in Vietnam. But, remember, I said perestroika. I didn't say anything about glasnost. It seems that Vietnam is trying to follow the Chinese model, not the Russian model, of uh, restructuring of the economy. Because the Vietnamese are, Communist Party is still maintaining control in its own hands, and they're not going to have political plural, uh, pluralism, even though there's a lot of ferment below. So, it's interesting. Hmm. We'll have time for one more news story after our interview with Arthur Kinoy. So let's have that interview and find out what's happening with civil liberties in the United States. We're extremely pleased to have with us on Alternative Views today Arthur Kinoy, who is a professor of law currently at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. Arthur is a veteran of many decades in the civil rights movement. He's the vice president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. He's a member of the National Board of the Rainbow Coalition. He's author of Rights on Trial, The Odyssey of a People's Lawyer, and he's a longtime member of the National Lawyers Guild. He's in town this week for the National Lawyers Guild meeting in Austin, and he kindly enough has come down to Alternative Views today, and we're going to talk to you about your life and struggles. Yeah, flying in here to Austin to come to the Guild Convention, all of a sudden, what hit me just between the, you know, shoulders was the recognition that I was coming down to Texas, and that struck inside of me the whole recollection of what had happened that morning in Washington in 1966, where Texas was deeply involved in my being, as you put it, strangled by the U.S. Marshals at the House Un-American Activities Committee. Because what I then remembered, I closed my eyes on the plane and I was reliving the whole <laughs> moment. I had been working the last couple of years before that in the Deep South, representing the very courageous black people who were organizing and fighting for their elementary constitutional rights. And I was representing the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Dr. King. And I was down in Mississippi, 1966, when I got a call from New York City and someone got on the phone and said they had just gotten a call from California that eight young students at Berkeley, California, who had engaged in, oh, the most radical activity you can imagine, they had organized the first anti-war committee in <laughs> California <laughs> on the Berkeley campus, and they had just been served with subpoenas from the House on American Activities Committee to come to Washington to explain why they were subversive agents of the Russians. <laughs> and would I come up from Mississippi and represent them because they had heard about a lot of work that I had been doing down in the South in defense of the courageous people who were fighting down there. And they said, we need somebody like that also. So I go up to Washington and I agree, all right, we'll do this. 
and I meet together with these young people from Berkeley, and what do they say to me? We're meeting late that evening, a day before the hearing was scheduled, and they said, we've read about what you folks have been doing in the Deep South, the lawyers who are representing these people. You don't sit back and always be on the defensive. You take the offensive, you fight against the people who are persecuting and discriminating against the people. We want you to do the same thing here in Washington. And I say, what do you mean? <laughs> and one of the young men says, my father in the 1950s was called before the McCarthy Committee, which was the same type of committee as the Un-American Activities Committee, and he didn't know what to do. He didn't want to participate in their process. So all he did is he got up there and he said, oh, I don't want to participate. I'll just plead the Fifth Amendment and so on. And what did Joe McCarthy do? He came out with this great phrase and he put his finger right at him and he said, you are a Fifth Amendment commie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so the young man says, my father was devastated. He got home. He was fired from his job at the plant. I don't want to play that kind of defensive game, he says. Do something about it. And that's something that we as people's lawyers, we were always told, and I'm told that still today and yesterday, by people who are fighting for their elementary rights against the system. What do they say to us? They say words that I have never forgotten. They say... Do something. And so what did we discuss? We decided to do what we had been doing for the courageous folks down in the South. We decided that we would take the offensive and start a federal lawsuit against the Un-American Activities Committee, <laughs> charging them with being totally unconstitutional, violating every provision of the Bill of Rights, and we charged a conspiracy on their part to undermine the fundamental rights of the young people of California and all the young people throughout the country. And we wrote out this complaint that late that night, went into a federal court, and then the wildest thing in the world happened. The federal judge looks at it and he says, you're making an argument here. <laughs> I'll give you a temporary injunction against the Un-American Activities Committee from holding the hearing. <laughs> And then he says, have you got a draft of, the, of an injunction for me? And my heart sank. Because I never dreamt that we would have the opportunity <laughs> doing that, so I hadn't prepared a draft. And then this young woman from one of the law schools, and thank the Lord for law students, because they save you all the time, she <laughs> comes up to me, and she'd been working with me, and she said, Arthur, I drafted one of these temporary restraining orders just in case we were going to win. And I give it to the federal judge, and he signs it, and then there are headlines all over the country, an American Activities Committee enjoined as unconstitutional. <laughs> and then, of course, what happens late that night, the Court of Appeals has a hearing at four in the morning in which <laughs> the government and the Department of Justice had come in and said, oh, you can't do that, that's impossible. So the Court of Appeals says, all right, we won't have a temporary restraining order, but they make a strong point We'll hear their complaint later on. So we're going to go ahead with the hearing. We're feeling good. And long and short of it, what happens? We go into the hearing. And who's the chairperson? And some of you folks here in Texas may remember him. Joe Poole. Joe Poole? Joe Poole was a Congress representative from Texas. One of the most conservative representatives of the old white power structure in the South. And he's sitting there, and what do they do? The first thing they do is all of our young folks are there. The representative for the committee, the council for the committee, calls then what they know as, and everybody in the country has got to learn this word, a friendly witness. Now, that doesn't mean friendly to you. <laughs> that means friendly to the government. To HUAC. And to HUAC, and the friendly witness gets up there, and what does he say? great detail. Oh, I know that these are all agents of the Soviets, these young people. They're getting paid by the Russians 
and I could see our clients, the young people, they look at each other, my God, and the one thing they don't have is any money, you know. <laughs> they never had. They had to borrow to even get to Washington. And then they, he finishes, and so what do I do? I'm a lawyer. I, I get up, and I say, all right, I want to cross-examine this witness. And what does Joe Poole say? You have no right to cross-examine. This is a congressional committee. Sit down. And I get very upset. <laughs> and I get up there and I say, wait a moment. I have a right under the Constitution of the United States to represent these young people and to cross-examine. Otherwise, there is not due process of law. And he says, you know what you're doing, he says? You're arguing with me. And what do I say to him? My lord, <laughs> what is the lawyer supposed to do? <laughs> and then he waves his hand, and four federal marshals from the back of the hearing room rush up, grab me by the neck, and drag me out. And I can still feel their fingers on the throat. And as I'm going out, I say something that everybody have kidded me about for years and years thereafter. I, the words that gasp out of me, I say to Paul, you can't do this to me, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and they drag me out, and then a friend of mine who had met in the old days in the South, several years before, from the New York Times, rushes up to me and says to me, Arthur, don't you understand why this happened? And I said, no, I don't understand. <laughs> and he says, nobody steals headlines from Joe Poole. You got those headlines? In your action against him, he was furious, and he was bound to get you. And then I'm dragged out in the corridor, and what? There are five Capitol Police standing there, and I'm arrested. And what am I arrested for? I'm arrested for a violation of a statute they had in the District of Columbia in those days, saying that you're guilty of disorderly conduct for using loud and boisterous language in front of a congressional committee. <laughs> and I'm arrested and then dragged down and fight that out. And the next morning, 54 lawyers from all of the country, from all the people's organizations, the civil rights organizations, show up to represent me. And then these pictures of me being strangled appear on the front page of almost every newspaper in the country. You upstage, Joe Poole again. Exactly. <laughs> and then, long and short of it, what happens? The Court of Appeals, I'm found guilty by the local judge, and the Court of Appeals just in Columbia says, nonsense. A lawyer has not only the right, but the duty to stand up to represent his clients. Uh -huh. They reverse the conviction. And then, this is late 1966, a whole movement starts in the country in which not only the folks in the anti-war movement, but people in the growing women's movement, people in the American movement all come together and say that the Un-American Activity Committee is the most dangerous instrument against the rights of the people. It's got to go. And a movement starts from one end of the country to the other to abolish the Un-American Activities Committee. And then what happens? In 1973, we get a majority in the House of Representatives and they vote to abolish the Un-American Activities Committee. And we have a great party that night. And I've learned one thing in the whole fight for people's rights, one of the most important moments in fighting for people's rights are the parties you have. The victory, <laughs> celebrations. The victory celebrations. And we're celebrating. And my old friend from the New York Times is there. And he comes up to me and he says, Arthur, you've got to realize one thing. The picture of you being strangled and pulled out of HUAC by those marshals did more to help the abolition of that committee than any brief you ever wrote, <laughs> than any legal argument you ever made. And he looks at me and he says, you've got to learn one thing. The one thing the people of this country cannot stand is the sight of a little person being strangled and beaten up by big people. And that was it. So that's a long way round to say that that was the fight. And what we learned out of it, though, was something that has a terrific impact on our work today. And that is that 
If you're going to fight for the rights of the people, for the protection of elementary constitutional rights, you cannot sit quietly on the defensive and just wait until they attack this person and that person and then you go through long, torturous cases. You have to think through, together with your clients, the people who are injured and hurt, how to take the offensive. How to utilize the legal system to say to the entire nation that there is a danger to the rights of all of us by what's going on and charging that the administration, the Department of Justice, or the local police, who are ever responsible for this, that they must be the defendants because they are guilty of what? They are guilty of the most serious crime conspiracy to undermine and destroy the Constitution of the United States. And that's the lesson that I learned out of the work in the 1950s against the McCarthy period, in the 1960s against the effort to destroy the black movement and the young people's movement and the women's movement and the experiences in the struggles that we had in the 50s and 60s against the effort to destroy the trade unions, that you cannot sit back quietly, you have to fight back. Uh, you have been in the middle of all these fights for so many years. Where do you think we are now? We've, uh, a lot of people have been concerned about civil liberties under the Reagan-Bush administrations and a lot of the plans that they have. You think, things are, you think that things are getting worse or better? I think that we are facing, and I'll put it very bluntly, and I say this from one end of the country to the other, we are facing the most serious constitutional crisis that this country has faced since the Civil War. And what is happening is a conscious plan by the most powerful forces in the governmental structure, in the industrial structure, to experiment with the undermining and abandonment of the most elementary constitutional rights of all of the people set forth in the Constitution. And that developed from the earliest days of the Reagan administration. And one of the sharpest examples is the open plan to undermine, bury, and then totally paralyze all of the statutes which had been passed in the 1960s guaranteeing the civil rights of not only the Afro-American people, not only people of color, but women, poor white people, older people, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which had been passed, why? Because millions of people in this country had organized and demanded that rights that they had been denied for hundreds of years must be enforced. All right, we won on that, and we got wonderful ways of going into the federal courts to protect people who were discriminated against in employment, discriminated against in any aspect of life, and what did, from the first days of the Reagan administration, what was announced? That these, the decisions of the Supreme Court were tot enforcing these statutes, were totally without any right whatsoever. And William Bradford Reynolds, sounds like ancient history, most people don't even remember his name, but he was Assistant Attorney right. General in charge of civil rights. And friends of mine on Capitol Hill in the middle of the 80s, they grabbed me into their office once. They said with a straight face, Arthur, we're going to put a resolution on the floor of Congress to change William Bradford Reynolds' title. We're going to call him the Assistant Attorney General in charge of burying civil rights. Right. And what was the position that he put forward? That there is no constitutional or statutory authority in this country to enforce group rights. You cannot have any remedy where women are discriminated against in a factory, for example. You cannot have a remedy 
which says there cannot be discrimination against women. We're black people, you cannot have a remedy. Where unions are discriminated against, union members, you can't have a remedy saying they are entitled to group relief. And what was this? This was an effort to totally bury the civil rights statutes, which were designed to what? To give protection to the Constitution, the meaning of the amendments passed after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They were passed for the purpose of protecting the group rights of not only the emancipated black people from slavery, but as the people who wrote the amendment said, to protect every class of people in this country who ever have a badge of inferiority placed upon them. And that is in the Constitution of the United States and the statutes are passed. And the Reagan administration position was, we got to get rid of this. And what was it? I have to explain to folks all over the country who don't remember our American history. And I have to say this, I'm very disturbed sometimes at the fact that there is not sufficient studying of the lessons of our American history. These, stat these amendments were passed and these statutes were passed to guarantee the protection of millions of people throughout the country. And then what happens in 1877? You have what goes down in history known as the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, in which what? In which there was agreement between the Northern Republicans and the defeated Southern slave owners, not the new governments of the South, that there would be no enforcement whatsoever of the wartime amendments. And then what? For 70 years, there was no protection whatsoever for the constitutional rights of not only the black people, but any oppressed person in the country. And then it's changed. Well, we're facing the same situation because what happened last June in the Supreme Court of the United States, where Reagan, over what, 10 years, had been able to appoint a handful of extremely conservative justices who then had a majority. They came down with sweeping decisions which had the same effect as the 1877 betrayal, which came down with legal gobbledygook. And I use that phrase, you know, why? Because we lawyers have a tendency, and judges, <laughs> to use words that nobody understands. Why? Because over the long years, and I say this in a self-critical way, our profession, the legal profession, uses terms so that people will not understand what we're doing. And then what happened was these decisions came down one after another, totally tying up the hands of the enforcement of the most elementary rights not to be discriminated against on the part of women, on the part of older people, on the part of black people, Latino people, Mexican-American peoples, young people. Native American. Native people. American peoples. And then what has happened? And this is a terribly important thing for us, everybody in the country to know. Some of the members of Congress just recently introduced a bill into the Senate, into the House, known as the Kennedy-Hawkins Bill, the 1990 Civil Rights Statute, which was designed to overcome these decisions and to restore the elementary constitutional rights of millions and millions of people to protection against any form of discrimination and the bill is now in the Senate and the House and what is happening? Thornburg, the Attorney General of the United States just six weeks ago publicly stated that he has advised Bush, the President to veto the bill if it is passed and tremendous amount of lobbying is going on on the part of the biggest corporations in the country who fear this bill because it's saying you can't discriminate against people. And if you do, you're going to have to pay damages. You're going to have to pay fines. And the corporations don't want this and they take the position, we have the right to do anything we please.
Arthur, let's go back a step before sure. we um, go into this bill in more detail. Why would the Reagan and Bush administration undertake a systematic assault on civil liberties doing some of the things that you've just described in opposing bills like this uh, Kennedy Hawkins bill? Is it simply because they're in the uh, hands of uh, corporations and are simply carrying out the policies or the wishes of different uh, corporations? Or why would a government be against civil liberties? It's hard to imagine that they would assault, you know, our very constitution, our very basic liberties. See, it cuts even deeper okay. than that. Because what's involved, the difference between the old 1877 and the new 1877 is that this is not just an attack on the constitutional protections of the rights, the emancipated peoples and of the peoples of color. This is an attack on every single constitutional right of every person. The right not to be, have your home broken into, the right not to be stopped on a highway and searched and frisked without a warrant, the violations of the Fourth Amendment, the protections of the First Amendment, the protections of the right to counsel, they have a conscious effort to weaken and undermine every one of these rights. And what is beginning to develop, and people are beginning to see this, the power structure, not only in the government, but in the big corporations, they are very frightened. And what are they frightened? that millions and millions of people in this country are angry and suffering from the most elementary problems that they have which are not being solved. One of the most shocking examples, and I'm sure you have some of this down here in Texas, I've been at many meetings all through the Midwest of whom the family farmers and hundreds of thousands of family farmers are facing what? The worst crisis in their lives, the farm mortgage foreclosure crisis mm -hmm. in which the big banks are coming in and they're open about it. They've decided that we don't need family farms any longer in this country, that we must have what is known as what? Corporate agriculture. Right. And they will be destroyed. All right, the family farmers, and we must understand this, they are not long-haired radicals. Right. They are what, what we've always known as the heart of middle America. And what are they saying? They're in meetings all over. They are furious. And why? Because they want, they went to the White House. They demanded what? What their grandparents got from a certain president known as Franklin Roosevelt. The first thing, and I, I, I was a youngster at that time, I didn't even remember this, but I'll never forget an older farmer saying this to me at a meeting in Kansas that his father had told him that the first thing that Franklin Roosevelt had done when he was elected was to sign a presidential decree declaring a four-year moratorium on farm foreclosures, right. giving the family farmers right. a chance to move forward, and they were saved. All right, they went to Washington during the Reagan period and then again the first this year of the Bush administration and you know what they were told by Reagan and Bush? Go home. We don't have any right to interfere with banks. <laughs> we don't have any right, we don't have any power to do this. So the family farmers are furious and what are they looking for? For the first time they want to work together with what? Millions of people and many of them across the state line from them who are facing what? The crisis of plant closings, hundreds of thousands, millions of American people. Workers. Working people. And many of them white working people, many of them people of color, are faced with devastation. And I don't have to tell you folks down here, you take a look, you go into anywhere along the Ohio River, for example, where the steel plants were first developed, and you go into some of these cities, and what does it look like? London looked like after the bombings in World War II because the plants are all closed down and the business people, the small business people are destroyed. There's no market and they're furious and they're trying to come together and what are they demanding? Very elementary demand. If these companies close our plants, we must have the right to run them ourselves. We must have the right to take them over. And the state of Pennsylvania, as a result of this pressure, 
from the majority of its people passed a bill setting up a plant closing agency that had the power under a again a technical legal word that nobody understands called eminent domain right. coming right. from where coming from the middle ages in england right. that a town has the power to take over property which injures the interests of the people of the town and they want to take it over and what are the big corporations doing they're going into court and they're charging that what this is bolshevism <laughs> this is un-americanism <laughs> We have the right not only to own a plant, to close a plant, period. All right, so the plant, the family farmers are saying, we can't win by ourselves. It's true. The plant closing people can't win by themselves, the working people, the union people. But if we get together, we have a fighting chance. And then what are they saying? We want to get together. And they've asked for meetings now, and this is making American history meetings with representatives of the black movements all through the South who are facing, as folks all through the South know, homelessness, homelessness poverty, poverty and uh, redistricting, losing the right to vote. Then you take in the urban areas of the North, what's the most serious problems? I don't know whether you have it down here. Drug, housing, housing, homelessness, and then the drug crisis from one end of the country to the other. So people getting together, take the women's movements. Women are furious because what? The same Supreme Court in June came down with a decision which put the knife in to what had been decided in Roe against Wade as the fundamental right of women to make decisions over their own lives, their own bodies, the right to abortion. And so the women are saying, we've got to do something about this. And not only the right to abortion, the right of women not to have sexual harassment in a job, right, right. which I don't have to tell you folks, that's one of the most current phenomena in our society, that women have this experience in factories and in employment and everything else. So if you add together all of these groups and they uh, unite to fight for what? All kinds of radical changes, nonsense, to fight for their immediate survival. needs, survival, what will that mean? And the folks in the power structure, the industrial military complex, and that's not a radical term. You know who that was first Dwight used Eisenhower. by? Eisenhower. Eisenhower right. yeah. first used that term. All right? If all of these folks come together and fight for their immediate needs, then the power of the industrial military complex is threatened. And we will have a change. We have a new type of government, a new type of government representing the needs and interests of the people and the power structure is scared to death about this right. and that's why they are saying that what do these people do they'll use these elementary constitutional rights to organize they'll use it to come together they'll use it to fight for their rights therefore a moment has come when we have to get rid of these rights and what are they putting forward and I lived through this in the Nixon period because I was thrown right into this fight in the Supreme Court of the United States, little concept known as what? The inherent power of the President of the United States to suspend the Constitution or any provisions thereof or any laws of the government when he decides it's in the national interest to do so. And they're putting that forward once again. <laughs> Well, this, isn't this already uh, in the books, in the McCarran Act, that the president can uh, declare an emergency and start putting people in concentration camps? No, it's not that? directly in the McCarran Act, but they are trying to read the McCarran Act as saying that. But what they are doing, mm -hmm. see, they came, you will remember, folks like us who were not just, you know, young people, will remember in the Nixon period, ancient history, <laughs> Richard Nixon that. came forward <laughs> with what? with the position that the president had the power to engage in warrantless wiretapping without considering the requirements of the Fourth Amendment that you have to have a warrant to engage in wiretapping. And what was the thesis that they put forward? The thesis was the president can decide whenever he, it is necessary that he can suspend the provisions of the Constitution. And I was asked the last minute to come in to take this case 
that involved young people in Detroit who were warrantlessly wiretapped to the Supreme Court. And we argued that out. And the Supreme Court itself, which in those days was considered what? Remember what it used to be called, the Nixon Court. Because there were conservative justices. Chief Justice Berger had taken over from Justice Warren. But when we laid it on the line that what was involved here was the essence of Americanism, that this country from the revolution on was built under the concept that this is what? This is a government of limited powers governed by the written constitution, which was written by whom? And I reminded the court something that as a youngster I've been taught something that Thomas Jefferson used to say, that there are not three branches of the government, the legislature, the judiciary, and the president. There are four branches. And the fourth branch is supreme. And the fourth branch are the people. And the Constitution was written to protect the people. And what happens is conservative court says, you're right. But now we have the Reagan-Bush administrations who are through FEMA setting up uh, additional concentration camps and martial law provisions. Provisions, and exactly. And that's the crisis we face mm -hmm. now. That's what, their response to these, their, the, to these turmoils of the people and the exactly. actions of the people. Exactly. And talking. what they are doing now is they are re-experimenting with an abandonment of the elementary principles of the Constitution and replacing it by what? Let's face it, what are they replacing it by? They're replacing it by total totalitarian rule of the master up there. So it gives the president totalitarian powers to, to suspend the Constitution, Constitution, to violate anyone's right whenever the president deems it's necessary. And what I discovered a lot of people yeah. throughout the country don't know mm -hmm. is that Reagan and Bush sent Oliver North to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, mm -hmm. right. to do a memorandum as to what they should do in case of an emergency where, um, where a lot of people in this country would not agree with their engaging in military activities. Like an invasion Like in an invasion or anywhere in the world. Right. And what should they do? And he writes out, and this was in, as you know, the Miami Herald. Right during the Iran-Contra hearings. July 5th, 1987. That the president should issue an order, and in so many words, and when I saw that for the first time, I couldn't believe it. Suspending the Constitution of the United States, suspending the Congress, and replacing it with a military government, suspending local and state legislatures, suspending the courts, and replacing with military tribunals, and establishing detention camps throughout the country in which any person who didn't agree with this proclamation would be thrown in. And this is what, and that memorandum, as far as we know, is still sitting on Bush's desk. And yet nobody, except I'm so pleased to hear that you folks on this channel have been discussing this. Because the media had, you never the media any never discussed of these threats to civil liberties on the mainstream media. And what's even worse, it isn't just a decision of the president. They've delegated that, they have provisions to delegate this authority to local commanders and police authorities so exactly. that they can suspend civil liberties on a local basis. On a local whenever level, they whenever they want to. Yeah. And I will never forget something that when I was once, thousand years ago, a youngster, a young student, we were in a room and we were coming together to talk out what were we going to do, this was in the mid-30s, what were we going to do as students to try to fight for our rights? And an older person, he was then 23 years old, came into <laughs> our room and said something that I have never forgotten. He said, you must never forget something that that greatest student of totalitarianism in this country just said last night. And who is he referring to? Huey Long the then governor of Louisiana. And what did he tell us Huey Long had said the day before? What the American people must never forget is that when fascism comes to America, it will come wrapped in an American flag. And that's something that I have never forgotten because that's the problem that we face today. And we have to be very open about this. What are we facing? We're facing the road to fascism. 
And when we understand that, millions and millions of American people will stand up and will fight for the elementary preservation of the American system of government. Yes, they're the un-Americans. We're the conservatives we're talking about fighting conserving for the... civil liberties and the constitutional exactly. rights, etc. And when we understand that, and we discuss this, and I find that when I discuss this with folks, with high school students, with college students, with folks in unions and community organizations, they haven't heard any of this, but when they hear it, they're ready to move. And they want to move. <laughs> it seems like the sort of lesson of your life is that if we don't struggle for our elementary civil liberties, we're allowing the road to fascism to take place in our lifetime. And exactly. those of us that want to mm -hmm. prevent fascism or repressive government from achieving in, uh, hegemony in the United States have to fight for these civil liberties. And Arthur, you fought for these for decades, and we can only applaud and admire your heroic struggles on behalf of our civil liberties. So thank you for coming and thank you for existing. And I can say that it has been exciting for me to have been down here in Austin the last two days at the Guild Convention where so many students from the University of Texas were there and in an excited way were discussing what they have to do in order to fight for these elementary rights. So there is some hope out there. Great hope. <laughs> thank you. Right. And now for one last news story from the Alternative Press. It concerns civil liberties and our political police. In 1983, a 12-year-old Pennsylvania boy was studying geography in school. And he was interested, got real interested in other lands around the globe. So he wrote a form letter to all 150 uh, member nations of the United Nations. Dear sir, please send me general information about your country. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Todd Patterson. Well, it was a big mistake. That's when his trouble started. Uh, as the responses began to come in a few weeks later, uh, they noticed, Todd and his family noticed, that uh, some of the envelopes were torn. In fact, they were torn open. And uh, this problem proceeded to get worse and worse and worse until uh, eventually 90% of all the mail coming to the house was torn in some way. Well, uh, after a few months, the problem gradually uh, disappeared and there was no more torn mail and uh, nobody thought much about it. And then Todd uh, wasn't uh, all that satisfied with the responses he got from some of the countries, so he wrote other letters. This time, uh, he wrote them on stationery from his dad's company. Uh, he crossed out the address, you know, and wrote his in up in the corner. Uh, well, once again, the mail started uh, arriving at the house all torn up. In addition, this time, the telephones began to act strangely. There's lots of static and uh, uh, buzzings and clickings in the background. And it was not only at the Patterson residence. It also happened at his dad's, Todd's dad's company as well. So uh, both phones got funky. Uh, this went on for months and months and months, and finally, after about six months, Todd's dad, in frustration one day, just yelled into the receiver of the telephone, if you want to know anything, why don't you come over and talk to us and find out? Two days later, the doorbell rang. Wow. And standing at the door was an FBI agent. He introduced himself, said he'd come to... Uh, uh, talk about these letters to other countries. <laughs> well, the family showed him around. Uh, they showed him Todd's room, and they offered to show him the files, uh, but the agent declined. They gave him a urine test? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> this gets better. And uh, uh, then he left. Uh, when Todd got home from school, he called the agent, and uh, they had a nice chat, and uh, that was that. Well, six months later, uh, the Soviets at the uh, United Nations, sent to Todd a letter and invited him to come and spend some time with him and look around and pick up some stuff in person. So uh, he and his dad decided that before they went, they better call the FBI, which they did. And the FBI said that was fine for him to go, but that he should call when he got back and report in. <laughs> well, they went over and they picked up a load of stuff. And as they were leaving, they noticed a guy believe it or not, in a dark trench coat and a hat, following them. 
Uh, they got home, and Todd called uh, the agent, reported uh, on his, his uh, uh, visit, and the agent was very friendly, and uh, they hung up. That was the end of uh, the incident. Uh, well, from 1984 to 1987, there were no more problems. Todd grew up, uh, and in his civics class in high school, they learned about the Freedom of Information Act. Well, Todd knew there had been some kind of FBI investigation of him, so uh, he decided to uh, look into uh, the Freedom of Information Act and try and find out what the FBI had on him. Well, he started writing letters to them, and after eight months of very difficult, uh, strenuous correspondence, um, he received his file. He received six pages. The rest was classified and could only be released under, with, under legal uh, constraints or legal action. Almost all of those six pages were blacked out. So Todd and his dad uh, were offended. <laughs> and they went to the ACLU and said, is there anything we could do? The ACLU took the case. Uh, they found out that Todd's record approached 100 pages. Uh, two indices that cross-referenced him to other uh, uh, FBI files uh, had been inadvertently lost. And uh, in court, they went to court, and the judge suddenly issued a ruling against Todd. His ruling was based on an in-camera uh, investigation of the secret files, or examination of the secret files, with an FBI agent there. Unfortunately, neither Todd nor his lawyer, the ACLU, uh, were notified. Uh, Todd has appealed the case, but so far uh, there's been no word, and he has still not seen what's in his FBI files. He's now a 19-year-old college student in New York, and uh, he's certainly got an education from the FBI. <laughs> Good civics lesson. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Civics 101. And that's Alternative Views for this time. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications, which we use on Alternative Views, and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We can also give information on how to get some of John Sockwell's publications. We'd like to thank our crew for our production. Brian Lynch, Karen Vines, Eric Eubank, and Kevin L. West. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. If you'd like to contact us, that's our address. Goodbye.